Thank you so much for uh, for being here. It's a real pleasure to talk to everybody here and kind of give you a little bit of a snapshot as to where the state of AI is today. And certainly evolved uh, a lot since Joel and I met probably five, six years ago. So let's get to it. So I think we're all here today to really discuss this concept about building AI-first products. Now, we're clearly entering a generation of building software companies, which looks materially different to what it looked like a couple years ago. And the reason for that is we now have powerful machines that can start to reevaluate how we as com users of computers um, make use of tools on our computers and what machines can do on the flip side. So to cast a bit of this difference, we can look at the pre-AI generation where we would traditionally have to make so many manipulations on a screen to get anything done and the machine really wasn't that assistive. Now contrast that to what you'll see today and I'll posit that we're really entering this generation of the AI first company, which is to say the computer starts to do vastly more than we have to do to accomplish the same tasks. But AI has been around for 50, 60 years or so. And what is the reason why we're where we are today? Now here I'm showing you a graph broadly of AI progress, if you will. And you can see broadly that there are three um, kind of main generations of, of AI. So from the 50s for about 50 or so years, we were kind of seeing sort of linear progress up and to the right in a sort of generation which was largely about very small models, largely built with rules on small data sets, trying to do things like predicting what's in an image. And then come 2013, 2015 or so, there was the advent or the idea that you could train an even larger machine learning system, loosely approximating how the brain works on uh, graphical processing cards, which you'll hear about today as well. And that really spurred this era called the deep learning era. Now, a couple of years ago, uh, in 2016, 17 or so, we entered what you know, we're now calling the large scale AI era. And this is the idea that the models are becoming significantly bigger than they were in the past, orders of magnitude larger, and so are the data sets. And commensurate with that, performance is going through the roof on many types of tasks, which previously were thought to be intractable. And one of the main reasons why we see all this progress is research. Now, a lot of you will be familiar with now household names, OpenAI and DeepMind, which you know 10 years ago were a couple of renegades thinking about how we could build intelligent machines. And they've contributed many of the meaningful papers that have driven the field forward. But what's interesting is that since you know, a couple of years ago when GPT-3 was announced, we've seen a, a kind of a small explosion in the number of new models that have been published, derivatives of that base model by different kinds of companies around the world, and increasingly open source models that are driven by researchers that are coming together on certain esoteric forums on the internet or Discord servers trying to create models for all of us to use. Now, if this kind of mini Cambrian explosion looks interesting, this is what it looks like now since last summer, where I think many of you will have encountered these text-to-image models where you can effectively write a description of what you would like a computer to generate, and it'll make a picture for you. And it's you know, fairly um, uncontroversial, I think, to say that now um, you know, the space is really lit on fire. But there are negatives with this. So while research has really driven uh, AI progress forward, the main loser, I would argue, is academia. Because as we've moved into this era of large-scale compu computing, where to be competitive, one needs to have extremely large clusters of these graphical processing cards to train massive models on large data sets, the result of that is that academia doesn't really have a place in this game because it doesn't have access to those resources. Depicted here on the left is a graph of the papers in, in the large-scale deep learning era that are contributed by academia, and you can see a plummeting down to the bottom. So I'd posit that governments have a really important role to play here, effectively as a buyer of first resort. And we can look back in history as to when they were buyers of first resort, back when integrated circuits started hitting the market in the 1960s. There, the US government bought all integrated circuits on the market in order to prime the space that would eventually take off in the commercial sector, but was still a bit too early to find product market fit. And on the bottom left, we can show you this graph that looks at 
um, certain countries that have this concerted notion of being a buyer of first resort. In this case, this is China and all of their developments in AI that are largely primed by the decision of the state to invest in this technology. Now, I'd mentioned graphical processing cards quite a few times, and what's interesting is that while progress is very open source at the model layer, it's not very open source on the, on the base layer in the computing stack. And by that I mean there are, you know, there's basically only one big winner here, and that is NVIDIA, which I think you'll hear about much more today as well. So here in our state of VR report last year, we created what we're calling the compute index, which um, effectively tries to measure how common the use of certain semiconductors are in AI research. And the best way to think about AI research users is that they're effectively the kind of early adopters, if you will. This graph shows you of all the open source AI research, which papers mention the, the use of an NVIDIA card in blue, uh, in green an FPGA, which is sort of a general purpose device, or in red, cards from Google, and in orange, cards from five major AI chip companies. And you can see that the chasm that NVIDIA has is wild. Now, it's not just research. These clusters are present in very large uh, companies. This is a graph that shows you the size of the computing clusters owned and operated for internal use at companies like Meta. So, you know, this is a business that has over 21,000 of these cards um, for, for its internal use. And in green, I show you examples of government-owned public uh, supercomputing centers. And so while there is one in Europe called Leonardo, which has, you know, a very respectable 14,000 cards, the number drops precipitously once we go down. So effectively, we see massive concentration of AI compute, which is required for this large-scale AI era that is governed by large technology companies and where nation states are pretty much not even uh, playing the game. And so to dive a bit deeper as to why like, these large-scale clusters are important, I show you this, uh, this slide here, which dives into this topic of emergent properties. Now, this is to basically describe this phenomenon that we're seeing where certain capabilities, like, for example, answering questions in Persian or doing model arithmetic, are not exhibited by models of a small scale. But as soon as you train the model on vastly more data, increase the size of the model, these properties emerge. They become possible, and they weren't possible before. This is why large-scale computing is very important. But commensurate with these um, emergent properties, what we're seeing is a heightened debate in AI safety. And this is, the, this is the idea of how do we build large, capable systems that are aligned to human preferences. In 2021, in our report, we highlighted that AI was not only a literal, but a figurative arms race. Here we show you the amount of money that's going into companies that are pursuing AGI as a mission. It's significantly growing in the last couple of years. And so we could argue, as my co-author Ian Hogarth does in this essay uh, called Godlike AI in the Financial Times, that effectively we're investing a lot into the capabilities of AI systems and significantly less in controlling them. A couple of years ago as well, we tried to really enumerate how many people were working on the topic of AI alignment. Whether you believe, in, you know, there's a, there's a spectrum of opinions out there as to what AI can do, but I would argue that no matter where you are in the spectrum, it's important to invest in controlling powerful systems. And here we show you that out of seven major organizations that are pursuing AI, a very small segment of their staff actually works on alignment. A few years ago, we would graciously count the number at about 100. Now, I'm going to highlight a couple of really exciting use cases, I think, that this technology is really unlocking. Um, the first here is this idea of learning the language of biology. So while GPT and other la language models like it learn human languages that we can all read and write, there are many other languages that are out there in nature. One of them is a language of amino acids to proteins. And proteins are the kind of molecules in your body that give rise to all the functionality that makes you human. And so these models can be trained um, on language of biology to predict protein function. And we can use this as a way to design proteins that are of interest, such as drug molecules. Very similar methods have been used to solve the problem of protein folding, which is very important because the shape of a protein helps you understand how you can design a drug to target it. This is broadly what a 3D structure looks like. 
And the net result of this is that if you're a pharma company, making use of machine learning to design molecules lets you be far more efficient with your productivity. On the bottom uh, right, I show you a graph from Excientia, which is one of the leading machine learning drug discovery companies that fairly regularly needs to produce 10 times fewer molecules in the real world to find one that truly works that they want to advance into clinical trials as is compared by the average in pharma. And so the net result of this is that while in 2020 we saw zero clinical assets that were developed using AI, today we see over 20 assets that are in clinical trials today being administered to patients and we'll see early readouts quite soon. Now, finally, I think I'll end with a, a kind of an even more grandiose like opportunity, which is this idea of energy sovereignty that's particularly topical in our current era. Now, one of the most uh, kind of attractive means of getting there is nuclear fusion, which is traditionally an extremely hard process to control in what is effectively a very large donut where you have high energy plasma that's circulating that's extremely hot and that you have to maintain in a perfect shape in order to orchestrate this uh, fusion reaction. And this is a classic problem where there's just far too many knobs for human experts to tune. And it turns out that one can use very similar methods in control theory and machine learning that are used to solve video game control on a nuclear reactor of this form. And this is some work that DeepMind uh, and a Swiss university produced uh, last year. And so uh, in ending, I hope I've convinced you that the progress of machine learning uh, you know, is constantly evolving over time, somewhat linear, punctuated by rather unpredictable step changes in performance that effectively leave us in a state where what we thought was previously intractable, such as self-driving cars in the state of San Francisco, is now possible. So with that, thank you for your attention, and I hope you enjoy the day.